crash landing of the DC-3 flight was a simulated exercise organised by the Newcastle Disaster Rescue Branch. The aims of such an exercise are to provide effective and efficient control of all emergency services and to eliminate police activities at the site of an aircraft disaster. 36 police, 11 ambulance vehicles, 5 fire brigades and 3 rescue squads attended the accident and carried out the duties which they would perform in the event of such an emergency. The 32 passengers aboard were volunteer medical students from the Newcastle University. Injuries received by the passengers included shock, massive internal damages and severe fractures and burns. The students played out their roles with conviction, which added realism. After they were removed from the airplane, the casualties were rushed to Maitland Hospital, where standby units were awaiting their arrival. Planning for today's crash took six months. All involved will take part in a debriefing to eliminate any problems in the event of a real air disaster. This is the ninth year the Newcastle branch of the Master Builders Association has recognised outstanding apprentices in this way. Five students who completed building trades courses last year were presented with bronze medallions. Three of the winners studied carpentry and joinery. Fred Goodman from Newcastle, Gregory Reid who studied at Belmont and David Bernard from Musselbrook. The first female apprentice to win an award, Maureen Alley, studied painting and decorating at Newcastle, while the final bronze medal winner, Mark Hazel, who studied at Maitland, was unable to attend the presentation. From the five winners, the Hunter District Craftsman of the Year was selected. The president of the Newcastle Master Builders Association, Mr Greg Davies, said the judging panel spent two weeks deliberating after assessing each candidate's character, technical ability and future prospects. The but there could only be one winner, and the final Bernard. decision was David Bernard for his outstanding performance in carpentry and joinery at Musselbrook last year. Since February, the grey mangrove on the waterways around Hexham has been attacked by a moth caterpillar and left to either regenerate or die. Not all the mangroves, but certainly enough to warrant representatives of the State Fisheries, Pollution Control Commission and Wetlands Trust to arrive on the scene. Too late, unfortunately, to stop the damage, or in fact to even find one single enemy caterpillar. Most had flown into moths. But as the State Fisheries Ron West explains, it is a matter of considerable concern. Yes, we are concerned. The mangroves are an important habitat for fish and prawns and also for the bird life in the area. And uh, we certainly haven't seen this sort of damage done in any other areas in the state. At this stage, I guess it's too early for you to be looking at solutions. I don't think there's really a solution here to be found. Um, it's a, probably a natural um, occurrence that happens on a fairly long-term cycle. That sounds very pessimistic. If there's no solution, what does this mean? No wetlands? Well, no, the trees are likely to recover. We hope they'll recover. We'll be following them and monitoring them over the next um, couple of years some, to see if they do recover. Well, this caterpillar must be known to you before. Is he this sort of aggressor? Well, as I said, we haven't seen it to this extent before. We have found insect damage to trees in some other areas in the state, but, but maybe to 200 trees or that, that sort of level certainly not the whole river which is basically affected here. Here you, the, the effect is about 72, about 70 per cent of the mangroves in the river and that represents about I think um, a thousand hectares or more of mangroves. In the park opposite the nursing home, we joined a young Ugandan lady and a Ugandan hospital therapist meeting for the first time in 10 years. Back in 1963, in the deserts of her home country, this young lady, Margaret Rose Illicol, had her face savaged by a hyena. In a hospital in Kampala, a therapist named Nightingale Kalinda not only cared for her, but was also responsible for getting Rotary International involved in Margaret's rehabilitation. That's been Newcastle since 1974, where she did her nurse's training. Her face is now recovering from the hyena attack, thanks to modern surgery. 
therapist Nightingale arrived to see Margaret today, ten years later. It's been lovely to just walk into these the gates and uh, see a very smart new face and a slim line. Did she recognise you straight away? <laughs> I think so. I think so. But uh, um, I, I, for me, it was too good to be true. This young rider is Clint Penfold, who at the tender age of five is an Australian BMX champion. He gained such prestige by winning the Under Fives Championships at the three-day Easter meeting at Launceston in Tasmania. Clint holds the record of being Australia's youngest ever starter in the sport when he competed at the age of two and a half in his first event. Since then, Clint has collected a total of 44 trophies by travelling to every BMX track in the state. He's a well-known contender among his peers. According to his parents, Clint has all the qualities of a world champion. His speed, determination and love of the sport make him a natural winner. His trainer and proud father, Terry, explained Clint's first interest in the sport. Uh, he was about two and ten months and uh, we were at a race meeting and he's seen a little girl riding the uh, same size bike as, as his own. And at that stage he had training wheels on his and the little girl won the, her age group and won a trophy and Clint came up to me and he said, Dad, I want me training wheels, I want to race. And it started from there. He's been racing ever since now and he's just turned five. To repair the damaged all trans, the dockyard will have to cut away some 150 tonnes of steel and then replace the torn and twisted plates and ribs with prefabricated hull sections. Speed is the number one priority. The ship's owners want the vessel back in service as soon as possible. Winning the contract under these conditions and against intense competition from a Brisbane shipyard is being seen as something of a vote of confidence in the dockyard's ability to now keep its industrial relations in order. Trades Hall Council Secretary Peter Barrick says he's elated the dockyard has been given a chance to prove what it can do. The dockyard manager Jim Kelly says some casual labour will be recruited to ensure the job is completed on time. He's doing a cross country run. Also Rob on the program will be Super right Sedans with some great clashes expected between newly crowned state here, champion Bob Brewer and other way. big shots Robertson including Stu Robertson clear, who was recently changed back from so Nationals to Supers. We know Gaddy, the Two Garrett, championships will also be featured on the night with the UFO Sprintcast New South Wales title and the Sprint Stocks Hunter Valley Championship. Organisers expected a high dropout rate from the triathlon which covered a gruelling 3.8 km swim, 180 km bike ride and 42 km marathon. But nothing like the 50 contestants from a field of 157 who were forced to call it a day. Wintry conditions were largely responsible. In the first leg, 28 contestants withdrew or were caught from the waters of Wallace Lake, suffering severe hypothermia. This included the world's ranked one and two triathletes, Americans Mark Allen and Scott Tinley. Former Australian Olympic swimmer Graham Winden was first out of the water, but collapsed from severe leg cramps. In the cycle leg of the race, the Australian triathlete, 18-year-old Stephen Foster, held an early lead over 24-year-old American Grant Boswell, who's ranked number five in the world. But Boswell soon went to first place, which he held to the end. Final placings were Grant Boswell first, Mark Dragon of New South Wales second, and Stephen Foster from Victoria third.
numbers are not great. They currently have about 20 members, but organisers say it's a very select troop. Only practising magicians or their apprentices need apply. Although it's officially known as the Newcastle Society of Magicians Magical Weekend, performers have travelled from many parts of Australia to attend. Today's activities included a free choice and close-up competition in which competitors have eight minutes in which to prove their talents. A very discerning audience then votes to determine the best performer. The Society's Magician of the Year will be announced at the annual dinner this evening and tomorrow an auction of magic wares will take place in Islington. The Shortland sub-branch of the Returned Services League of Australia in conjunction with Moritan Mayfield Valley Cell conducted the commemoration service. It was preceded by a march pass which started from the north of the Pacific Highway and Walls End Road and proceeded to the War Cemetery. Detachments representing ex-service men and women led the tribute. They were followed by units from the military forces and cadet units. After the detachments had filed into the War Cemetery, the service began. The last post was played and two minutes silence was observed before the laying of wreaths. Services marking Anzac Day this Thursday continue throughout the week. An annual remembrance service organised by the Newcastle District Council of the RSL is being held in Christchurch Cathedral this evening. On Wednesday, the combined school's Anzac service will take place in Civic Park and on Thursday, an Anzac Dawn ceremony will be held. More than 180 students forgot about their classes and put all their efforts into a jumpathon. Despite the rainy conditions, the students' spirits weren't dampened and in teams of six they skipped in turns for three hours. Some students took the opportunity to show off their skills. The jumpathon was an extension of the health exercise program already running in the school. Students are encouraged to learn about exercise and nutrition and each week take time out for health hustle activities. To raise money for the National Heart Foundation who provided the skipping ropes, the jumpers were sponsored and have already collected more than $2,800. According to Jumpathon organiser Debbie Lowe, response to the event has been rewarding. An overwhelming response um, from both the community of Swansea as far as sponsorship goes, uh, the parents coming up and helping out on the actual day and the sponsorship itself. I think we hope to raise quite a lot of money for the National Heart Foundation. What are you, Nicole, is an extremely depressing play. Following the school and home life of a rather withdrawn and unconfident 15-year-old, it comes to the conclusion that life has absolutely nothing in store for her. Nicole's mother and father constantly compare her unfavourably to her older sister, her schoolmates tease her unmercifully, and as well, Nicole just doesn't have the strength of will to get herself out of the doldrums. I found it a bit hard to know what the group was trying to get at. There were no positive aspects to this play. It simply showed a very sad loser caught up in a world full of extremely unpleasant people. A lot of the material captures the spirit of home and school pressures very well, but many of the scenes went on far, far too long, saying the same thing again and again. Perhaps director Barney Langford could have exerted a bit more control. Because the play was devised by the group of teenagers themselves, one must respect their attitudes on the pain of growing up, but I just wish it hadn't been quite so bleak. I think it was very tough and cynical to suggest that the life of a 15-year-old has absolutely nothing in store for it. servicemen in vehicles. They were closely followed by the 2nd Battalion of the Royal New South Wales Regimental Band. 
Those who took part in the procession included the First World War veterans from the Light Horse Brigade, the Royal Navy and those surviving diggers. Second World War veterans of the Polish contingent and the French Foreign Legion joined the marches from the Royal Australian Air Force. Soldiers from the Vietnam War took their part in the parade that marched to Civic Park for the official Anzac ceremony. More than 1,500 people walked the decks of the vessel and looked at some of the ship's impressive defence weapons. HMAS Brisbane is fitted with modern combat data, sonar and radar communications. This five-inch gun is one of two on board the ship. Brisbane's main role is air defence and the Tartier missile launcher is specifically designed for anti-aircraft exercises. Supersonic control dishes track the enemy aircraft and guide the missile to its destination. This impressive piece of technology is an Australian-built ICARA magazine. Its role as an anti-submarine missile has been adopted by both the British and New Zealand navies. With a crew of 330 downstairs, the galley is kept busy. And while the public scurried aboard, some crew members decided to make the most of their day off. The Brisbane will be open again to the public on Sunday afternoon, and according to some visitors, it's worth the trip. Good, unreal. What part did you like the best? The cannons and the guns. And why did you like them? Oh, I just like a lot of military stuff and guns and stuff. Are you going to join the Navy? Psst. I don't know. Just think about it. <laughs>